Good morning. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for inviting me over, over the pond to, to speak to you. Um, I, uh, yeah, I got this talk ready probably three weeks ago, um, but since then I've been to uh, Zimbabwe on a three-week study tour. So we've been to the Allen Savory Institute and um, a lot of, uh, lot of farms. Um, so my, head, my head's pretty, pretty blown at the moment because I've only been back a day. Um, and it, it's, if we're talking about regen, if you go to a third world country, it's, it's very important that we, that we factor in that. And I would say it's an amazing country, amazing, loving people. And if you talk about resilience, then speak to a Zimbabwean farmer. Um, but I'll try not to <laughs> get too involved with that. Um, so, yeah, I was, uh, I was asked to speak with uh, Tim May, who is the owner of Kingscote Estates. I'm um, the owner and director of Roaming Dairy, so we share farm on, on that estate. Uh, he's left me to do it on my own, so I'm going to have to uh, try and be both of us. Um, so myself, I'm a first-generation farmer. Um, I grew up on a what I'd call a lifestyle block. It was, parents had a 14-acre farm, and we had... Uh, a house cow we milked by hand, we had beef, we had chickens, we had um, goats, uh, geese. And when you look back, they say what happens between the ages of three and seven shape your career in some way. Um, and, and I guess I spent those years in mud with my brother and sister, playing in the hay barn, milking cows. And I guess that's where my passion and, and love for farming came. So from those very early years, I knew I wanted to farm. Um, brother and sister have done something completely different, and so I, I guess I was the last one in the bath, and, and I was stuck with the mud on me, and it absorbed in me. Um, so the soil was ingrained in me in that early years. So uh, skip forward, uh, I went through education, went through traveling, and then I, I started looking for land. Um, so to fast track where we are today, uh, we run three farms. Uh, I've got a farm of about 1,300 acres, which is all rented. Uh, we have 700 uh, breeding sheep on there, 700 dry sheep, and about 50 suckler cows. Um, we manage another farm of 300 milking cows, milked once a day on an organic system. And Kingscliff Estates is 2,500 acres, and that's where we set up the share farming. Uh, so we're milking 450 cows on that unit in a regenerative way. Um, mixed with an arable cropping. Um, so that, that's basically how I got to Kingsclear. So to now speak about Tim's journey, uh, Tim, Tim would be a fourth generation farmer. Um, yeah, so it'd be a two and a half thousand acre block. Um, what would have been traditionally a mixed farming, uh, they had 500 milking cows, uh, an intensive pig unit and an arable. And, and that was kind of the model in the UK um, in the 80s and 90s. But when reflection back, what was happening is, is all the resources were coming back to the central point. So the dairy, all the nutrients would be in a round circle around the dairy. Um, all the pig, manure, and slurry was only spread on the surrounding area of the barn. And so slowly, all the resources and nutrients were coming to a central point. Um, so Tim. Tim came back to the farm in 2004. Uh, his dairy and his pigs unit needed um, massive capital investment. And at the time in the UK, milk prices and commodity prices were on the floor. So I guess he was forced to change. So they sold the cows, uh, sold the pigs, and, and went all cropping, um, which was a slippery slope. But it was quite a normal thing to do in the UK. Everyone think they'd go arable, and, and that was the future. Um, he did that for 10 years, and then he quickly realized that all he was doing is depleting his soils. Um, he spent most of his day trying to kill stuff with a sprayer, um, putting fertilizers on. Um, so Tim, Tim did a nuff field in 2011, which mostly changed him, um, changed his thought process. The, the Kings of Estates have always been quite progressive in, in, in what they've done. Um, so Tim quickly came home and wanted change. So he, I think in 2014, put his first herbal lay mix in, uh, which is basically 17 different species of grassland. Um, so he's moved away from the monoclog um, cropping. Um, 
to put everything in and very much as a mindset, what grew, grew. We didn't try to force, force anything to grow um, and let it grow. So that was kind of his fertility building stage. Um, and then he cropped. So half the farm was in herbal lay and half was in, in crop production. Um, he, he then had to work out how to make that profitable because to, to be regenerative and to be sustainable, you, you've got to be profitable. Um, and there's some hard changes and there's some hard times. And we did five years a business plan to make sure it did work. Um, but, but it has to be profitable. Um, so then that's when Tim, that's when I kind of got involved with the share farming agreement um, that, that Tim realized that it was too big for him to manage himself. Um, so he, he put an avra in a farming press to say a thousand acres of herbal lays, do what you want with it, um, just come and have a go. Um, so I was actually at school with Tim, but I hadn't seen him for about 20 years. So I went out of curiosity to see to see if it can work. So after going around the farm, I, I quickly, to be most profitable, dairy, dairy in the UK was the way to go. Um, and if we we're going to be dairy, we were going to go organic because it, it fitted the system. Um, so that's how we started. But there was no infrastructure on the farm. Um, so we had to be mobile. Um, because two and a half thousand acres and we wanted to go on every inch of the farm. We didn't want to get, fall back into the same problem as before as, as being a ring fence around a certain area and bringing in nutrients back. So it's very important that the livestock went on every inch of the farm. Um, so yeah, so we've built a mobile, mobile parlor. Um, it's a 2040 herringbone parlor. It's exactly the same as a static system, but just with wheels on it. Um, we put temporary fencing up. Uh, temporary water supply all over ground. We do freeze in the UK, but it's black pipe, and it, I guess it thaws out within the day. Um, we have blown blown air down the pipes at night to make sure it's clear to get to get running water. Um, so that's how we started in 2017, uh, milking 180 heifers in a mobile system, and and today we're milking 450. Um, we started off with. Our organic masses were probably two and three, and within five years, we're up to seven and eight um, percent I I organic matter, and we're, we're growing a lot more grass already. So, so there's massive improvements from just having, having the dairy cow um, or the livestock units on those systems. Um, it, it, um, so we wanted to do a lot of mob grazing, we wanted to do a lot of um, trampling, but with a dairy cow, you need, need daily production. So it, it, there's a balancing act between the two. That, so we, we run our dry stock through like 5,000 covers, which would probably be, be up here somewhere, and we mob that down and let that regen through the grass. And the dairy cows are probably on a 35, 35 36-day rotation. Um, so it's in cropping, so we're in grass for five years, and then we're going into cropping for, for four years. So I would be like the fertility building stage, but taking a bit of milk out of the system. Um, so that's how I'm making the profit. And then Tim's gaining from the, the nutrient value that the cows are putting back in the system. Um, so the, the share farming agreement works as in Tim's putting his land in, I'm putting the cows in, all the infrastructure's mine, and, and the labor's mine. It's two separate businesses. Um, and then we come to a split on, on the values of what, what we put in. So all my bits, if you tip Tim's estate upside down, all my bits would fall off. So for security-wise, I, I haven't invested in concrete or, or fixed infrastructure that I couldn't take with me, um, which was very important when we started because we only had a five-year agreement. So we had to make sure that we weren't going to pour, pour money into Tim's farm, although I am leaving the nutrients behind, and that's a... <laughs> <laughs> we're still undecided how you how you truly value what what I'm putting back it, back into into Tim's farm. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a regen. Yeah, it, it's a funny word because it, it's. I guess we've probably been doing it. We didn't even know it's called regen. We just thought we were farming, um, probably for the last last ten years. And and my worry is that it's. It's now, 
it's now become a buzzword, and I hope it doesn't get diluted with because it was sustainability before, and now it, and now it's a regen word. And I hope it, like organics in the UK is is governed and, and audited, but this regen word at the moment is flashing around, and and I'm just worried that um, that hopefully someone will grab hold of it and put some standards to it. Um, so, yeah. So. So, when you, so, so going forward now, so we, we, we've got the dairy going through, we've got the cropping going through. We've also got mobile chickens going through, which come behind the dairy cows, which are scratching, scratching uh, the cow feces around and adding fertility. So that's, that's a different share farmer, so that's his own business. So that's, that's adding to the land. Um, and, and now Tim's thinking is there's, there's a, an abundance of opportunity on a, on a piece of land. Um, Whereas traditionally you just look at one thing you can do with that land is farming, but but there's so many opportunities that you can stack on top of this enterprise stacking that the, the cows can come through, the chickens can come through, the pigs can come through, and it, it's all durable, but it, it's the people behind it. So so Tim is running a, um, a a thing now called Pitch Up, which every year he invites. It's like a bit like Dragon's Den. I don't know if you have that in the UK, but it's um in, sorry in, in America, but. So people are invited to come with their ideas to the estate. And, uh, and last year he awarded it to someone who's doing um, picking food for rabbits, so they're foraging the estate. So they're not actually taking much from, from the actual land, but it's another business that, that's surviving off the land. And when, when you change that mindset of what that part of the land can do, there's, like, there's an abundance of, of opportunities that, that can come from one single piece of land. Um, so we're all about, so regen, regen now for the farm would be about the people and, and the community and, and trying to gain, gain more people back on the land because the UK, we went a long way away from people not being associated with the farm. Um, so we're very much working towards trying to get people back onto the land and, and, and now the future's even brighter because we're now part of the climate change and we're the only real industry that can really help help improve that. So actually we're becoming more, not just a food producer that's trying to kill people, but actually trying to, trying to actually help with the climate change and, and the energy and, um, that you can get from the land. And the previous speaker said that the natural resources, but to me, the abundance of natural resources is sunlight. Um, and all we're trying to do is farm, farm sunlight. And the, there is a saying, I think, that there's an hour and a half of sunlight a day around the world will power us, the whole world. So. I think we underestimate what the sun can do for us. Um, yeah, so I think, how am I doing for time? Yeah. How many? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so the, the journey, yeah, the journey I've been on is, um, Yeah, I didn't really know it was it was regen um, where we where we went, but but Tim to have Tim and myself together, we've got like two two different managers that are coming at different levels. So so whereas farms farms are very um, farms in the UK have stuck at the top and not allow people other new entrants in, and and the share farming the share farming movement, which is making more more of the UK is that Tim and I, like Tim has the massive capital behind him, um, and, and I have the enthusiasm and, and the ideas to farm, um, but, but banks in the UK um, won't lend, uh, won't lend unless you've got the security. So, so how, how, how Tim has helped me is he, he'd have the asset base to, to allow me to, um, to set up farming, and then he, he comes from a different mindset to what I come from. So we're basically running the estate on two, two of the same, like two managers, but with the same goal. Um, so, it's, so that's really helped. So any, any young farmers trying to come into the industry, I, I'd encourage the, it's almost like the grooming stage where you, you have to mar like find the landlord and you have to have the same goals and, and the same ideas, but, but you've really got to open this land up to the, the new generation and the new ideas to, 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 to gain access to the land. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably just asking questions, so otherwise I'll, 
I'll just, I'll just go the wrong way otherwise. We can move into the questions. Um, thank you so much, Oliver. No worries. This is kind of a short round of questions, so we'll go fast, but we got one right here from Brian. Excellent, thanks. I just had one real quick question. That is, uh, as you increased your organic matter to the levels that you did, did you notice an, an effect on your infiltration rates and the amount of runoff you were getting from your farm? Yeah, so, so we, we measured, so we're soil sampling um, every five years, um, and we are getting more flash heavy rainfall. Um, so we're definitely holding more moisture than we were before. Um, how you quantify how much it's tricky. We are very slope, slope, but probably not like you are. But we're now looking at like key line, doing some key line work in, on our slopes because we we feel we should like we get 700 mil of rain a, a year. But it, I don't think it's the amount of rain you get; it's how much you can actually hold on our ground. Um, so we've just been through a three-month drought, which I know means nothing to you. <laughs> <laughs> to, to you guys, but, but it, it's what you're used to, and, and that's, that's not normal for us, and we've had 38 degree heat, um, and, and we didn't grow anything for 90 days, and, and if that's the new norm, then, then we've definitely got the organic matter there as a sponge, so we are going to capture more water, and it's now whether do we put these key lines in across the slopes to see if we can slow down the movement of water. Thank you. Um, we got time for one more question. I don't know if there was any from the virtual. I'm not seeing any, so we'll take one more in person. I appreciate the pointing. It's really helpful. Uh, my name is Mary. Um, I, if you have time, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about the resilience of the Zimbabwe <laughs> farming. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you want to, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a long subject. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's quite an emotional subject, to, to be honest. Um, like I was at uh, university with some, some Zimbabwean people in, in 2002 um, when the land reform happened. Um, and I didn't really, until you go there, it's 20 years later and it's still going on. And, but there are people there making a go of it. Uh, like 200% interest, 250% inflation. It changes daily. Um, but, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one to, to contemplate. So, but I, 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 like we talk a lot in, in the UK about resilience. In, in business, and I've gone there and just thought, yeah, <laughs> that's resilience. Um, but yeah, thank you. Mm. Thank you. I'm gonna take a one word answer to this online question, because it's all the time we have, which is, do you have a written agreement? Yes. Yes. All right, thank you so much, Oliver. Yeah.